Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to Forest Park and to our senior center. Uh, some of the faces I do recognize they've been here. This is our third out of four environmental seminars. The first two, one was on coyote management and the other one was on native plants. And if you haven't seen those, then go to my website. When you get to my homepage, scroll down to environmental videos click on that and you will see the coyote video and also the native plants and you can watch it in the, in the comfort of your own home and these will also be on there as well so tell your family and friends if they're interested and they're sorry they missed it where they can catch it okay some housekeeping chores just to let you know the bathrooms are in the back to the right over on this table there are, there's a list for emails. If you want to be on my email list, please put your information on there. I will include you on my listing. And there are also some handouts. If you haven't already had some handouts, please go ahead and take those. Now, how we're going to proceed tonight is very similar to what we've done in the past. Uh, Carol is going to present her presentation, which I'm, I can't wait. She's got more stuff than I even imagined. Um, after her presentation, we will have a question and answer period. But in order to, for the, to be picked up by the video and everything, we ask that you be recognized, come up to the podium, speak into the microphone so that we can get a, a clear question for people to hear on, on the video. And then we will do raffle prizes. And hopefully everybody's got a ticket. I, see, I saw somebody come in. Make sure that you get a ticket before we do that. Okay. So right now I'd like to introduce Carol Mundy. She's my environmental expert for the year. She, like I said, is responsible for giving the four pre uh, environmental seminars. She's always interesting. I'm always learning something from her presentation. I can't wait to know what I'll learn tonight. So without any further ado, Carol, it's all yours. All right, number your papers one to 15 <laughs> for the test at the end. Well, as Wright said, I brought a lot of stuff, and I had to stop myself from going into my collections of things to share with you, because I'm just a little over enthusiastic about sharing these things. Um, as we work through this program, there may be some other questions that come up, so you jot them down, try and remember them. Uh, that way we can move through more quickly, and I'll probably be moving over here to talk about some of these things on the table as long as the clicker works. All right. So, whose yard is it anyway? Just when you think you have the yard the way you like it, everything looks wonderful. Everything's trim and pretty, the flowers are blooming, maybe the veggie garden's doing well, and then... <laughs> and all they can say when you roll up on them and you put the window down in your car, what are you looking at? Have you noticed that I have two that come into my backyard, I'm in the C section, and we can get maybe from here to the gentleman in the blue shirt before they decide, all right, maybe I should leave. I'm like, Man, that's bold. Thank you for the buffet. <laughs> I now have a complete fenced in veggie garden that has an eight foot cage around it. Complete ceiling just to keep those fellows and the squirrels and raccoons out. It doesn't keep everything out, but it does pretty good. All right, so when you're thinking about what your yard is like and you have to do a little bit of homework and if you were at the native plants class, maybe you learned a little bit. I promise I won't test you on that tonight. But once you've learned about native plants or what's in your area, I want you to think about what is native in the, wor in the way of wildlife to your backyard. Do we have alligators in Ohio? Not many. Not naturally. <laughs> exactly. With enough coin in your pocket and some internet site, you know, you can have a bobcat in your one bedroom apartment or an alligator in your bathtub until your spouse or your mom says, you got to get rid of that thing. And then they go off to some wet place and let it go. And that used to happen all the time. I worked for Hamilton County Parks for almost 30 years. And the number of things that were dumped and let go at parks, yeah. And a caiman, we did have a caiman, which is a smaller type of a, a alligator type animal that was out at Miami Whitewater. So, never say never, but the goal is not to have those around here. 
And then, of course, do more homework. I do want to let you know there are punks in nature. Sometimes they do things just to be punks. Think about the squirrel that's ripping out your pansies in the spring. I may plant the pansies in the pot next to the door three or four times a day. They're not eating them, they're just digging them out. Whether it's an oil that's on my hand, the smell of those new plants, something in that potting mix that makes them go nuts. It makes me go nuts because there's the dirt again. Well, things like vultures have some of this crazy behavior. This is down in the uh, Everglades, right there by one of the main um, Royal Palm Visitor Center. And when you pulled up to the visitor center, if you parked too close to the visitor center, you noticed that there was a, a van or a car and it had a big drape over it. And I was trying to think about, okay, you know, what's going on? They're trying to keep it cool from the Florida sun. No, that was the person, the naturalist working at the visitor center protecting her vehicle because as soon as she'd walk away, the vultures would come down and start ripping out the rubber weather stripping. They weren't eating it. They weren't giving it to their mate. They were just being punks. So yes, we still have punks in nature. For the fun of it, I said. And then there's you know, people who go out and look for trouble. I, one of my goals was to see a live uh, armadillo on a trip to Florida, because you used to see them squashed by the side of the road. In case you haven't been following uh, nature adapting, armadillos are moving northward. They are a, being spot in Tennessee and even in a spot in Kentucky. So someday in the next 20 or 30 years, we could have armadillo in Ohio. And you thought you hated moles. So let's consider what your habitat is like or what's near your yard. Is it wet? Is it wooded? Is it meadow or prairie? Is it your prized bog garden? Maybe you have the roses that have been passed down through your family from your grandmother who brought them over from Europe at some point. Is it that secret garden of treasured plants? And of course, whatever your favorite plant is, that's where the deer's gonna go. That's where the chipmunk's gonna dig a hole. I, I mean, you might as well pretend you hate everything out there and then they'll leave it alone. Do you have any wet or watery places? This is a small pond in my backyard. I had one lotus, one year that bloomed. <laughs> but I have frogs, I have toads, I have salamanders, I have turtles. Next to me is a person that has an in-ground pool. They get more turtles and salamanders in the filter of their pool than I get in my nature-y backyard. So my nature will text me, meet me at the fence, I've got another one. So if you have those things, you know, if you build it, they will come. It is true. Why they would want to go into the pool as opposed to a nice wet spot on the other side of the fence, who knows. But just think about that. They may be there and you don't know about it. Other wet creatures. Many years ago, uh, when I was a naturalist, you would take turns answering the phone. People before email, they would pick up the phone and say, hey, do we have lobsters in Ohio? And of course you wouldn't laugh because you not supposed to do that. But you'd say, well, yes, we do have an animal that looks a lot like a lobster. We have crawdads, crawfish, crayfish, whatever you want to call them. I back up to Army Corps property. It gets very wet. And sometimes I have these towers in my backyard. So you have that crazy mud structure that can be this tall or this tall. And it will be open at the top because as that water table is rising below, they're going to add more uh, mud to that and it's their chance to decide if they want to move to a different habitat or a different spot or just let some more air percolate through that. My advice to you is don't stick your finger in the hole. You may have seen a cat or a dog who sticks their paw down in there. And if you happen to get this guy out, they're not going to be very happy. But they will be in these watery spots. Any of these little rivulets that run when it gets wet, you could have them up on the sides and then when it's uh, too much water, they end up someplace else, back down by the Winton Lake. If you are thinking about what your garden's gonna be like, I would encourage you, don't forget about adding water and shade. It's really important to do that if you wanna have some wildlife. I mean, there's no way to say, okay, you can come in, but you can. It doesn't work that way. But if you have some good shade, even if it's the old concrete water basin like your grandmother used, you might be rewarded by a big fat toad. 
A few years ago, I had, um, this is before we changed the type of light we have right outside the house to reduce the amount of light pollution, we put a, a yellow light. One year, I had a big, fat female toad who went up six of the steps to my porch and would wait each night. Think about the effort that that took for that toad to climb up those steps. But that meant she had that space all to herself. There was no competition. It was right underneath that white light, and she was getting all the yummy bugs. So this is a good guy. If you have toads in your yard, that is a good barometer. That means you have good soil moisture, you have some good shade going on, some yummy bugs that aren't affected by in, uh, insecticides. And when you use insecticides, that's some of the collateral damage. We think about we're trying to kill the bad bugs, but that's what you need toads for, to eat those bad bugs. An engineer who's all wet. All right, so if you're finding um, trees that are cut down like this, that really sharp piece, there's lots of wood hanging around. Of course, you might think, what is going on here? Well, we now have beaver all over the state of Ohio. We have them on every lake, and then sometimes they will end up riding um, from one lake to another through one of these creeks or the waterways that are here. And they can be quite damaging to the point where, in the state of Ohio, if a beaver builds a dam and it floods a commercial area, that person can now petition for that animal to be trapped and euthanized. There's that many beavers that they will not relocate them. Commercial properties don't like it when their area gets flooded. I mean, they're excellent engineers. They will pond up area. I don't care how many times you clear out that culvert. They will pond it up again. And it benefits all of these other wildlife, but not humans so much. Um, just to give you an idea of size, that's the size of a beaver's skull. So next to my hand, you can see that's pretty big. Then here's the pelt. It's not unusual for these guys to be upwards of 60 plus pounds now. Another little fellow who ends up in our neighborhoods is the muskrat. And years ago, when I was working down at Winton Woods, the Forest Park animal control people came down with an animal in the trap going, what is this? I don't know what it is. It was a little muskrat who's about the size of a football. Remember that reference? We had a program where we used the size of a football. And if you know what a beaver's tail looks like, it's flat. The muskrat's tail is shaped like this. So think about a butter knife, and he moves that to steer himself at the water, but not very big. And he doesn't build a big wooden uh, lodge of sticks. His is lots of, not so much mud, but lots and lots of vegetation. And you might find that on the edge of lakes, or if you go back by the retention basin, you might find them. Occasionally, they end up in areas where they shouldn't be, like my front porch. <laughs> Many years ago, I was coming home. I was carrying in the groceries. My dog stopped at something on the porch. I said, leave it. Amazingly, he did. Went in the house, came back out, and looked. Here's a muskrat. Well, now I'm looking for the little note that says, I found this muskrat. It needs your help or something. I was that lady in the neighborhood. So I go in, and I get my gardening gloves. And my husband says, that thing's going to bite you. So I go back in, and I get my raptor gloves, which are ladies' welding gloves. And I go and pick him up. Sure enough, he bites the glove, pees all over the place, jumps down, takes off across the porch. I never see him again. Now, I live about three doors from one of the creeks that runs through Forest Park. So I started knocking on my neighbor's doors. Did you did this? Did you do this? No. Nobody did. I asked my coworkers. Nobody would admit to putting that muskrat up there. But it had to go up six steps to sit on the porch. They will ride those little wet areas. Think about the ditches that we have around Forest Park that lead into the larger creeks that may end up in Winton Lake or into the Mill Creek. Those become the waterways for them to move on to different territory. And if you think about this last spring, maybe you had ducks in your shrubbery. Once in a while, I'll get a call from somebody that will say, there's a nest outside my door, and there's 14 eggs in it, and it wasn't there yesterday. 
calm down a minute and think about this. A duck can lay one egg a day. She, it's not like puppies where they all come out at one time. So one egg a day, she lays the egg and she goes away and she lays the next egg and she goes away. And around the 14th day or so, then she readjusts things and she sets and she incubates for four weeks. And in four weeks, all of those little guys hatch out within about an hour of one another, no matter if they were laid in the egg at day one or day 14. Isn't that amazing? They all hatch at the same time. Once they're fully dry, she gives the signal to follow, gets them away from that nest. She used your house or your shrubbery or your business as a safe zone. They're less likely to be bothered by predators such as cats, dogs, coyotes, fox, raccoon, if they're up next to the house. So now we have this kind of interrelationship going on. She calls to the babies. In this case, it could be a problem if you're up on the second floor and your nest is in a, a window box. In this case, it was inside the Winton Center's courtyard many, many years ago. So we would open the doors and line the hall, and it was make way for ducklings all the way down to the pond. She might have, I mean, I'm doing quick math there, there might be 18 or 20 ducklings that go. And every spring, you're going to see that news where some, something on the news where a person stop traffic or the firemen came and they got the little ducklings out from underneath that uh, rain um, opening to the sewer, the rainwater. Those grates are pretty wide and you're talking about a duckling that's you know, not much bigger than a playing card. The problem is she can't count. So she starts to go and she hears them peeping, but if she can't get to them, at a certain point she's got to basically cut bait. She leaves that little guy, I know it's really sad, she will leave that little guy to save the other 17 that she's caring for and move on. But if they're rescued out and it's peeping loudly, it will run, she'll call to it and it will run right back to her. If you have a nest outside your house, do not put down water and do not put down food. As much as you wanna be a good neighbor, that creates more of a problem because now you're drawing scent to her. Raccoons, skunk, dog, cats, whatever, will smell that. When she's laying eggs, she'll come in and she'll be there for an hour or so. And even when she starts to incubate, she'll take an hour or two away each day, different times, a little me time, if you will, go get something to eat, get a good bath, refresh yourself, and come back to it. But if you put that food and water right there, Chances are she may not even eat it anyway because she understands, believe it or not, understands that become, becomes more of an issue. She's very vulnerable when she's feeding. <clears throat> now, of course, if we're talking about geese, that's a whole other thing. If you call me and say, there's a goose nest outside your door, I'm going to say, whew, good luck with that. All of those birds are protected by federal law. You cannot um, catch, capture them, you can't kill them, you can use some light harassment, but that's about all. But when these geese, and think about it, they don't really migrate anymore. They just go from this pond to that pond and from Winton Lake down to Spring Grove and back again. We don't really have strong periods of freeze, so they don't need to go very far. And they love mowed grass. That's nirvana to them. So think about that golf course. They fertilize it, that gets watered, they mow it so it's always fresh new growth coming on. And so they're out there eating it. And if you are looking at that, we're talking about do the math. If a goose weighs 10 pounds and makes two pounds of you know what every day, you can just assume in a group of 20 or 30 birds how much remains are on there. And if that happens to be in a place where you're having a picnic, maybe you don't want to sit in that necessarily. You probably don't want to play golf in it either. So that's the other situation with these geese. And when we have these open areas that we put those big wonderful fountains so they stay open all year, bubblers they're called, that encourages those geese to stay around. And then of course if it's near a house or a bunch of houses, those people decide they need to feed them. And that just brings you more problems. You've got the geese, You've got the food, you've got the things that eat the geese food, you've got the things that eat the geese. So it's better not to have a bubbler within that uh, waterway. 
If you're next to a woodland, I'm going to say, hooray, it's so great to be next to a woodland. You get that benefit of the shade, but you also have the other creatures that are in that woodland that may end up in your yard. And you just have to find a way to compromise, if you will. For me, I'm always excited about what's coming in. I mean, I've had all the different owls come through. We can now see the eagles from Winton Lake. Of course, we've had coyote and fox, pileated woodpeckers. It's just amazing what comes through. All kinds of uh, box turtles and red sliders come in. So woodlands and forest edge are very busy places. Not as much so as if you were in the dense forest, but on the edge that might back up to your yard. That becomes that kind of a walkway. They have that entry point. It gives them an easy way in and out. You didn't know you were providing that for them. That's what the deer do. They're using that entry point. Can you see that house that's up on a tree? That, um, in fact, I think I have a better picture of it. Yes, holes are good. So that big house that's up on a tree is called an all-purpose nesting box. It looks like a bluebird box on steroids. It's about this big and has a hole about like that. It will accommodate flying squirrels. Yes, we have flying squirrels in Forest Park. Regular squirrels. It will accommodate things like kestrel, not so many of them around anymore, and screech owl. And occasionally the raccoon will chew that out and make it big enough for him to get in. So if you happen to be on the edge of the woods and you see some of those big boxes or one of your neighbors putting them up, you'll understand that's what it's about. But maybe you have some uh, trees on your property that you can allow to stay. Now, we're not talking about things that are dangerous. We don't want it to fall on your house or your car or your neighbor's house. But if there's a spot within your, within your property that you can allow a tree, even if you cut off the upper limbs and you left that snag piece and it had some holes in it, chances are you'll have some good wildlife, things like bluebirds that may be using that hole. I have a love-hate relationship with squirrels <laughs> and chipmunks. Um, around here we have eastern chipmunk and of course they're extremely busy checking every little thing, digging holes everywhere. They can make a hole about the size of a 50 cent piece. If it's smaller than that, it's likely something like a shrew. We do have the gray squirrel, but he can wear different colored coats. We have the gray squirrel, we have a black squirrel, and I don't know about you, but in the C-section, we have some white squirrels. They're not albino. They have brown eyes and brown toes. They're not pink eyes and pink toes, so not completely um, missing that melanin. But they are so bold. When they come in, I mean, sometimes they won't even bother if a blue jay comes after them. They just turn their back. And I'm sure you've seen all the crazy videos, the ninja squirrel videos where they have them going up and over to get to the food. It's remarkable how they can figure that out. Oh, I'm going to hang it off of the clothesline. And the next thing you know, you've got, you know, the squirrel volenda grang walking typewrite out to the piece that's hanging down. I mean, you, we've got pictures of them hanging on a... Um, a feeder for hummingbirds, and they tip it a little bit, and we'll get some of that fluid out. What you may not have been familiar with is the fox squirrel. So in the wooded sections around Forest Park, you may find what looks like an oversized, it's a squirrel who looks like he's wearing his uh, grandpa's coat because he's much bigger. They're much more reclusive compared to the gray squirrel, and you might just get little views of them around. And they're not nearly as gregarious. I mean, if, if the gray squirrel comes in and fox squirrel's there, the fox squirrel will leave. Gray squirrel really has a, I mean, he's kind of like a Pomeranian who thinks he's the size of a Great Dane. Never give caffeine and sugar to squirrels. They don't need it. They're already squirreling. <laughs> Rabbits. It seems to go in spurts, doesn't it? Some years you have lots and lots of rabbits, other years not so many. This year we've had both big guys and little guys around. And what you need to know is that female rabbit may make a nest less than six feet from your back door, right under your dog's nose. It's amazing how they can do that. They don't have to have a very big or very deep scrape. They pull out some of the fur from their body she lays her babies in there. She covers them back up with fur and little bits of dried grass. 
and she leaves them. That's the hardest part for humans, is she steps away. You wouldn't think about going away for a few hours from your baby, your newborn, I hope not anyway. But she steps away. She feeds them in the morning and at night. And the rest of the time, she's feeding off in your clover. Another reason not to cut your grass quite so short, so they can have something to eat. And in just three weeks, that little cottontail is ready to be out on its own. Three weeks. Their ears will be perfectly upright. Their eyes are bright. And the telltale sign is if you have to chase it, it doesn't need your help. I've gotten calls where somebody said, they're out of breath. I got this bunny. I chased it across Winton Road. It probably didn't need your help. And, and they will die of fright. I work with wildlife rehabilitators. I had been one in, in another life. And I will tell you that rabbits have this high fear factor. They are prey. They, they fuel the world. They fuel the world of wildlife. Everything wants to eat a rabbit. And so when they are contained, when they are restrained, their heartbeat goes so fast they can actually succumb to that. They don't do well in captivity. But she may go on to have many litters. Depending on the season, she might have four litters in a year or more. <laughs> if you have rabbits, you probably have these. Uh, we do have quite a good red fox population in uh, Forest Park with all the little waterways and covered uh, creeks, nice woods. So here's a red fox, and you can come and take a look at him. A red fox tops out at about 15 pounds. People often think they're much larger, but it's that tail. That tail is as long as the body. And you can see mama's kind of tired of being a mama. Uh, this, was, this was actually in the neighborhood up by um, Lake Erie, Lakeside, which has a lot of cottages that people don't stay year round. And my husband was up there doing some other photography, and he found this den underneath the house. Nobody was living at the home at that time of the year. And the pups would come out and, you know, sit on the chairs and play on the stoop. And it was at a spot where the two roads came together. There aren't sidewalks in that community. And if you walked on the roadway, no problem. The pups were fine. Mama didn't bother. If you cut across the grass, which youngsters often, human youngsters often did, she'd make one little noise, whoop, and they would all dive up underneath the house. But she always looked exhausted. I think she had seven kits. And of course, we do have coyote here in Hamilton County and in Forest Park. We talked about that uh, population a few years ago. And amazingly, in some places, Coyote has enough to eat that it doesn't have to bother with taking out things like raccoon and fox. In some communities, coyote strives to be the top dog, so it's going to go for all the other predators, and that includes things like fox and raccoon. It may be cats and dogs because they look like competition. Not necessarily to eat them as food, although they won't waste it, but it's really because they want to be the top of the heap. But what I have found is I'm next to that Army Corps property. I have both red fox going through there and I have coyote. And there, there are plenty of rabbits around, so I don't know what else they're eating, but they're, they're very well fed. This was one eating a roadkill out in Yellowstone and then leaving his calling card by peeing on it. Out on, in a situation like this, they have become so adept to understanding that that dead thing is edible and they will actually look both ways watch for cars, go out to the road, eat that, and, and get out of the way. And out in Yellowstone, there were little red, uh, not red, but mantled uh, ground squirrels, kind of like a larger version of our chipmunk, and they would be squashed all over the place. And the cleanup crew would be there pretty shortly. You didn't have to worry about it going to waste. How about the opportunists? Poor possum, they get blamed for so much. Possum is an opportunist. If raccoon comes in and he pries open your garbage can, or heaven forbid you put out just a plain plastic bag, and it gets ripped open, and possum gets in there, and you find possum in the morning, who are you going to blame? Possum. If he's in the bottom of the garbage can that got tipped over by raccoon or some dogs that were out, who are you going to blame? Possum, because he was in there. Possum wants to find food that's easy. That includes things like insects, 
um, things that are on your compost pile. It could be worms, crawdads, leftover fruit, dog food, cat food, the garbage can if it's tipped over. That's too much trouble for him to tip it over. But raccoons know how to disassemble about every kind of garbage can that's out there. If you go to any campground across the state of Ohio, there's usually warnings about how to secure your cooler so that that $10 worth of bacon isn't gone when you wake up in the morning. The number of raccoons around the state of Ohio is so high that you cannot, if you're having trouble with one, one gets into your chimney, eating your food, making a problem, and you call a qualified, a, cert, a licensed trapper, they cannot relocate it. The number of raccoons is so high, that animal will have to be euthanized. And that's part of the other thing about being a homeowner, a property owner, is that if you're having trouble with raccoon, possum, whatever it might be, skunks, to understand what the laws of Ohio are. Now, if you have a raccoon in your chimney and you got it out and you let it go on your own property, not a problem. But if you catch it out of the chimney and think, oh, I'm going to take it down to the park. I'm going to take it out in the country. I grew up way out in Coleraine Township when it was nothing out there. You could see the Milky Way. It was so wonderful. And people used to dump things all the time. Well, all that does is kick the can down the road. And about in the late 90s, there was a situation where a, a variety of rabies came up into the eastern seaboard and then down into Ohio. And so they stopped allowing some animals that are considered rabies vector species, raccoon is one of those, skunk, fox, and so on, from being translocated. So if they get into trouble and you have to call a wildlife trapper, they are required by law to humanely euthanize them. And that puts that uncomfortable situation back on you. You have to ask those questions. And if you're not happy with the answers, then maybe you look for another wildlife trapper. Not a happy subject, but we live close to one another, and sometimes we collide with this wildlife situation. You don't want a raccoon in the house, absolutely. Black and white smells like trouble. Uh, I think Forest Park is the skunkiest place I have ever lived. I, it, I've been here 30 some years and it seems like when we have a nice evening and we can finally open up the windows to let that air come through, that Pepe Le Pew comes through about two o'clock in the morning and stinks it up. They are really on the move right now. The clock is ticking for them. And what's going on is they're trying to build up fat. So they're gonna be in your garden if they can get to it. They will be on the compost heap. They will be eating the leftover cat food or dog food but they will also be digging up holes where ground hornets, yellow jackets. If you find a chipmunk hole or a mole hole or another small hole and you have seen those yellow jackets going in and out and you know how nasty they can be at the end of the summer coming after your picnic. So the yellow jacket puts this inside of that hole. That's, that's one way to keep the chipmunk from using that entrance. And then it's gonna fill that with eggs and then developing larvae. The skunk can smell that. It's an easy resource. They're not bothered. The stings can't get to them. They will dig that out, but it's not a polite dig. It's like major, huge. It looks like something went in there with giant claws and dug that out and you'll find pieces of this papery nest. So they're gonna be doing that until we have the first hard frost. They may also be digging up your lawn. Now you might think, oh no, I have grub damage. Not necessarily. They're going to eat not only Japanese beetles, but anything else in the way of a beetle, a developing pupa of a, um, there are quite a number of moths that are just below the surface in a little pupa case. And they're digging up all of those yummy fat and protein rich critters. They're doing you a favor. The only problem is you can see here, they don't replace their divots. Um, this fellow, I think that, he was, um, at that time, he was the mayor of Madeira when he called me about this and sent me this picture. But I had that happen in our yard. We were gonna be taking up grass and we kind of agreed on a space in the backyard and I happened to be away for a couple days and I came back to a very similar looking area in the backyard and I was thinking, man, he dug up the wrong spot. It wasn't Mr. Mundy, it was skunks. But they can do, that's probably a 10 by 20 area in one night. 
And my advice to you is if you happen to find that, after you get those curse words out of your system, <laughs> is to just go and replace the divots, get your kids, your grandkids, the neighborhood kids, to replace those divots, water them in, walk them down. It may happen a time or two, but as soon as we get that good hard frost, it will all settle down. So they're eating those insects. They're actually doing you a favor. It just doesn't look like that. The other thing about skunks is they're trying to tell you to leave them alone. What's the color? Black and white. Black and white. Stay back. They don't have very good eyesight. And if you happen to be out as it gets dark or in the middle of the night, maybe you're coming or going, you'll see they have this kind of little, almost a funny walk where they waddle back and forth. And they'll stop and they'll try and size you up. If you stay real still, they're like, eh, they'll keep on going. But if you walk to them, first I, I would ask you why you would be walking towards them. <laughs> right, first thing he's going to chatter. He's going to make this sound, which is a skunk grumbling, which is, I can't believe this guy's coming towards me. The next thing he's going to do is stomp his feet, as if that's going to be scary to you. And if you move to the next point, which is turning around, it's too late. You're going to need a lot of tomato juice and peroxide to get that stink out. So they're giving you fair warning. I'm black and white, leave me alone. And most of nature has warning colors, red and black. Um, in fact, I have some fine prizes that are big, uh, large umbrellas that you can use to scare their wildlife that are black and white. Like if you want to scare the deer or maybe you don't want that coyote hanging in the yard, you can use that. Here, we'll use this one. Uh, this is an excellent tool. This one is green and white. Not all wildlife are going to see the green, but they will see that it's dark and then white. So black and white is always a warning color. The next thing is you may have that fox, coyote, raccoon, whatever it is, know that you come out to check the bird feeder or check on your plants. They've got you down. They, you know, it's 8 o'clock. Here she comes. She'll go back inside. I'll have the yard to myself. If you want to scare them away, you could walk out with a big umbrella, and they're going, to be, they're going to stop and look. And hopefully nobody is too superstitious. But when you push the button, you've got that first, you've got that nice pop. Do that again. And now, from being five foot tall, now I'm five foot wide. And I have all these warning colors. So this is an excellent tool to keep by the back door in case of rain. Take it for a walk. You know, you come across works for all kinds of things. You come across a coyote, you're not really sure. You could do that. Make a deep voice. Ladies, as we tend to get afraid, what happens to our voices? It goes really high. <laughs> so you have to make yourself big and mean sounding. But if you have those warning colors, and somebody will go home with one of those large umbrellas that's black and white, so you can be like the skunk, and maybe they'll leave you alone. Stay. <laughs> it looked like it was going to pop open. Oh, one more um, side note. Do you see the skunk with that little container on his face? That's a, a yogurt cup. And um, the company that makes that shape, it's YoPlay was actually petitioned to change the shape of that cup, which they said no. But now most yogurt cups and small cups like that come with a little notation to please squash it, cut it, or whatever, so wildlife doesn't get stuck. And I see stories like that all the time, where an animal has gotten their head in a peanut butter jar or a yogurt cup, and it may be for, for days before they get help. It used to be that woodchucks groundhogs, whistle pigs, whatever you want to call them, all the same thing, were more of a rural problem. We didn't think about them being in the city of Forest Park or even the city of Cincinnati. But guess what? They're here. They've adapted very well. And again, they know when you go out to fill the bird feeder, and as soon as you go back in, they're going to your prized garden as soon as you're not looking. So that's one of those situations where you could use your um, big umbrella you could also use some of that fine, stinky spray. Maybe, right, we'll grab one of those. This is a commercial grade spray, and we have a couple bottles that we'll be raffling off tonight. There's also a recipe of uh, a spray you can make yourself to spray on your plants. The reason uh, this one is higher, high test, I would say, 
Its first ingredient is putrefied egg solids. So probably not something you want brewing in your kitchen. In fact, I would not store it in the house. I'd store it outside. But you can spray that on your plants. I always recommend that you spray a lower leaf to see how it's going to react. It's going to smell very strong when you first put it out there. It will fade a little bit to us. We don't have very good sense of smell. But wildlife will pick that up. Now, you might have to reapply it if we have strong rain like we had today. But that stuff works pretty good, especially if you're, you're waiting on that prize bloom. We had some lilies we were waiting on. And of course, I'm sure the deer were like, OK, tomorrow's the day I'm going to eat them. So we went out and just gave a little spritz. And the lilies got to bloom, and we got to see them. Woodchucks now will big, dig some very big holes. They usually have one hole with a big mound of dirt. That's kind of their front porch. And then they'll have other access holes that might be 20 or 30 feet away. And there's just a small opening with no dirt. And that will be hidden under some shrub next to the house, next to a patio, in the tall grass. You may not find it unless you happen to trip on it. Most people are looking for that big mound of dirt that you might see that groundhog sunning themselves out there. But there, there are other ways to, um, to look for that. Do not put the hose down the hole. Do not put kerosene down the hole. Do not put gasoline down the hole and think you're going to light it. Or we're going to see your picture because you're on the way to the hospital that night. If you are going to put anything in the hole, start with something easy like a deterrent. You can get some household ammonia in the you know, washing soap aisle. Soak some rags. Something that's cotton is better. Stick that down in the hole. If you have a dog, collect up some of the dog dew and put it down the hole. My, my kind of battle cry was, foul the hole. So if you go and get something really stinky and foul the hole, whether it's a skunk, a groundhog, whatever, they do not want to live in a dirty spot. And when you put something from another animal especially, that's a real assault to them because somebody else is moving into their hole. It's not just ammonia. The other thing that works pretty well um, in, this, in, in this bottle is pelleted pine. It's used for, um, they put it in stalls for horses to catch the urine when they pee. Um, we happen to use it instead of cat litter. But I will take this, scoop some out like this. It's dry. I can put it in the hole water it in or allow it to get rained on. You could add a little ammonia or a little bit of a, like a peppermint oil to that. And this will puff up. I mean, it will puff out. It, and then it's just, it's just wood. You can cover that back over. And I encourage you to wait until that's not moving anymore. You don't see any activity at that hole. Because if you see a hole and you just go fill it back up, groundhog is going to push it all back out. I don't care if you use rocks and timber and all this kind of stuff. They will move it out. So if you decide that they're done, you're not seeing any new activity because you put some of this in the hole or some stinky ammonia or whatever, now's the time you can start backfilling. And about the last 10 inches, you're going to use either sand, like you'd put in a child's sand box, or pea gravel, a tiny, tiny pea gravel or gravel screenings. And the reason for those two things, or three things, is that when the animal digs, it falls back on their self. It's not like big round rocks. You think, oh, I'll fill this with rocks. Those are easy to move. If you're a digging animal, no problem. But if you're digging through sand, it keeps falling back in on itself. So the last 10 inches, sand, pea gravel, or that um, screenings, limestone screenings. That ammonia works pretty good to try and get rid of those things. Why are we so in love with our lawns? <laughs> that really is a problem. He's trying to do you a favor. He's aerating the soil. He's eating worms. He's eating grubs. He's really not trying to be a bad neighbor. But of course, when you come out and you find a hole or you find a big mound, you're pretty upset about that. My advice to you is if you find a mound like that, get the shovel out, get a bucket, and scoop that away. As far as putting something down the hole, keep in mind, all they eat is alive. So it has to be a wiggling worm, a pupa case that's moving, uh, a grub. They don't eat dead things. They don't eat poison peanuts. 
They don't eat chewing gum and get it stuck in their belly. So all those wives' tales that are out there are misnomers. You can still buy things for, they call them gophers. We do not have any gophers in Ohio. You have to go to Missouri and onwards to have gophers. Moles, you can go to a lethal trap. So it's a device that has a harpoon, but that's going to take a little bit of skill. And so you either need to do your homework to learn how to use them properly, or you might hire somebody who does that. And they can show you how to set them, and then you can be on your way to catching moles. Uh, if you've never seen a mole alive, this is what they, this one's not alive, but he's in beautiful shape. They have fur that is so soft, it's not like the fur on your dog or your cat or the hair on your head. Do you ever part your hair in the wrong way and it kind of hurts in that spot? The mole's fur means they can go forward or backwards in the hole. It's self-cleaning. And their body is shaped a lot like um, a walrus or an Olympic swimmer. You see a swimmer that has giant shoulders, and then they're very narrow-waisted, and that's how they are. Their uh, front feet is just the same bone structure as your hand, but it's all um, in one piece as opposed to us having all these different digits going on there. So it's like a, a catcher's mitt. They have an excellent sense of smell, and they have these tiny little uh, whiskers that allow them to feel for movement. They pick up that movement in their body and then their whiskers. They don't see very well. They do have eyes and they do see, but not very well. We have um, had these before where we happen to dig one out. You put it in a big aquarium, you put some dirt and you put some dead leaves and you drop a worm or a fat June bug or something on the other end, boom. As soon as he feels that or hears that moving, he's over there gobbling it up. They um, are active year round. So you think, well, I'm not gonna see much of them after the first hard freeze. They just go lower down into the soil below the frost line. But as you know, here in Cincinnati in February, it's pretty darn warm and it happens to be mating month. So Mr. Mole is coming up and he's going around looking for all the ladies, having a little you know, supper, maybe a little romantic music, making more moles. So they'll be really active at different times of the year. They're not as active right now, uh, just because we've had a big dry spell. They are insect eaters only. You might say, oh, well, they're disturbing my plants. You're right, they are, but they're pushing that plant by them digging. They're not eating it. They're dislodging the plant's roots from the soil. And you know that's not a good thing. That plant has to be tucked in nicely into the soil so it will survive. Don't discount things like spiders and other good insects in your yard. I know people have a big aversion to that, and I, I can understand that, but they have a job to do. That cicada killer that's about as long as my finger, right now she's hunting, hunting, she's hunting for cicadas. She will go and find one annual cicada, sting it, basically she's injecting a paralysis type drug into it. It's alive. She puts it down into a hole. She lays one egg on it, covers it over, and then she goes and does it again. You don't need Science Fiction Channel. Just study how insects do this. It's really impressive. So that big cicada killer will be out. Now the problem is if they are, they really like sandy spots. So a playground, a volleyball court, the horseshoe pit, you're more likely to see them, especially at this time of the year. And it's only a few weeks, but it's just something to be aware of. You would almost have to grab one before she would sting. And I say she. All of the boys, sorry guys, they got no stingers. Sorry to disappoint you, they're all bark and no bite. All of the females, wasps, hornets, bees, all of the females have the stingers. They are fully armed. And they're not very aggressive compared to say the yellow jackets or a bald face hornet. We also have things like the giant praying mantis. I've been seeing quite a number of the little guys around right now. You might see them on the screen door or on the screen of your window. They're out hunting, trying to eat as much as they can before the frost comes in. Honeybees and all of the native bees are quite active right now, so if you have some late season bloomers, let them stay, let them bloom so they can make the food. 
Thankfully, we don't have any spiders as big as what's on that picture, but that Argiope, she's about that big. And if you add in her legs, it would be about like that. Of course, if you don't like spiders, she looks like she's about this big. Yeah. She makes a web that's about 30 inches, 36 inches across, and this beautiful orb, and then she's the one that's called the writing spider. It has that big zigzag in it. And that zigzag, you can see it in her web there. There's two philosophies. One is birds see that and will avoid it, and insects are drawn into it. Either way, the spider wins. She will lay in the middle of that orb, and she will put her legs together to form an X. Look at her colors, almost black and white, mostly yellow and black. So she's warning you, I'm here, please leave me alone. She will eat and eat and eat, and then just like in Charlotte's Web, she'll go put a big old egg case somewhere and guard it. She dies off over the winter, and those babies will hatch out later. Oh, yeah, Charlotte. <laughs> and that green bug is not an em emerald ash borer. That is a tiger beetle. If you are seeing tiger beetles around your house, you need to pat yourself on the back because that means you have great habitat. You have a healthy insect zone. They like a damp area near uh, creeks, near the river, a sandy spot. There's quite a number of tiger beetles. That one is that really gorgeous iridescent green. And they're about the length of the first knuckle on my baby finger. So those are good guys. A lot of hummingbird moth action going on right now. You might think it's a baby hummingbird, but it's actually the hummingbird moth. They're active during the day, one of the few daytime feeding moths. If you have uh, flocks, I have tons of flocks, so I have lots of these guys. And hopefully nobody's going to get up and leave the room because we're talking about snakes. I don't know why poor snakes get such a bad rap. In the state of Ohio, yes, we do have rattlesnake and we do have copperhead. We also have massasauga rattlesnake. They do not naturally exist in Hamilton County anymore. Now, I'm not saying there might not have been something brought in by some crazy collector and let go. We hear about that kind of thing. But often what happens is the northern water snake, who kind of has a bad attitude anyway, if you're walking in the creeks, especially around Winton and those, those big runoffs where there's that creek and some deep areas, you may find that northern water snake. And if you are one of those people who likes to catch snakes and look at them, you may also suffer some bites because they bite, 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 and ask questions later. Unfortunately, their color is just the slightest reminiscent of a copperhead. And too often, I was presented with pieces of the northern water snake when somebody said, I killed this copperhead in Winton Creek. Nope. Nope. We have the milk snake. Do you know why it was called the milk snake? Because they would hang out in barns to eat the mice that were fouling the hay and the grain. But somewhere way down in history, somebody came up with a story that the milk snake was attaching to the teats of the cow and sucking out the milk. That's where that came from. Look at his pretty pattern. Unfortunately, that gets him thrown into a slightly look-alike, maybe kind of sort of copperhead. When you see those two things side by side, they do not. If you really want to learn about these snakes, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources has an excellent field guide of all the snakes of the state of Ohio, and you can see these things side by side. Just put in Department of Natural Resources, Division of Wildlife, and you can download that for yourself. And garter snakes come in all different kinds of colors. I have one that hangs out in my veggie bed. He's about the color of uh, kind of a sandy soil color. And then what we used to call was black rat snake. Now they call it the eastern gray or eastern rat snake. They are excellent climbers. So going up the side of a, a brick building, especially if there's a little bit of a uh, ledge, an old stone house, um, if you have wood siding, they can climb trees. Um, and they will go up and eat birds, which everybody has to eat. Uh, they're really excellent climbers. As we move into the fall, you may end up, I'm just telling you, you may end up with a baby in the basement. They're about the size of a pencil, not any bigger than my finger, but about the length of a pencil, and somehow they find their way underneath the rubber stopper on your garage door or through that opening, you know, that maybe the laundry, uh, dryer came through, and you might find them there under 
your uh, slop sink in the, in the laundry room. Or in my case, my cat's staring at it, wondering what it is. So I don't want you to freak out too much. Just try and stay calm. You could put a box over it. You could put a big cup over it. Scoop it up just like it was a giant bug and take it outside. Try and keep your heart rate from going too high. Snap a picture, send it to me, whatever. Just try and stay calm. I know that's hard to do if you're afraid of snakes. You know, wildlife will always find ways to adapt to us. Like I said, the duck will be next to the property, next to your home, because she feels safe about that. Here's a robin on my neighbor's house. And unfortunately, the first year, she put it where the western sun was beating down. The next year, she put it on my side, which was now in the shade. So they learned. Wildlife are quite at ease in your backyard. I mean, really at ease. You know, this is an X-rated. <laughs> CJ has seen this picture before. Yes, these are two eastern box turtles, and they are connected. Because as I approached, she closed her shell, so he was stuck. Shame on me for taking a picture. But you can see where they were digging in the yard and the amount of time it takes her, for, with her feet are so tiny, to dig a deep hole to lay out 25 or 50 eggs, cover it back over and go away and wait 60 to 90 days. She's not even waiting. She's on to the next chapter of her life. And then the babies that are about the size of a quarter come out at the end of summer into early fall and you might find them on their way or in your pool hopefully a good, good spot for them. Unfortunately, we still have issues with our urban tigers. If you have an outdoor cat, you may have them going after birds or chipmunks or whatever in the yard. And that's a very hard conversation for you to have with your neighbors. Um, this was my neighbor's cat, not my cat. He thought he lived in my yard. That was his pond. He also was in love with my dog to the point where I could say, hey, Charlie, tiger's here, and the two would play like kids. But this cat would go after birds. When he was young, he caught a toad and brought it up to me. And the toad puts out kind of a really yucky taste because they don't want to get eaten. And that cat was foaming. It looked like shaving foam coming out of his mouth. I got the toad. He was unharmed. I took him away. I took the cat back to the neighbors. A couple hours, couple hours later, he was there doing the same thing. So that's just one of those hard conversations. And really, what kind of neighbors are we anyway? You know, we, we complain about wildlife, but then if we have places where we're dumping and trashing things, where are they supposed to go? Or cutting for a new highway or a new building project? We have this attitude, you know, kind of them against us. And so I'm going to ask you to kind of turn that on your, turn it on its ear and think about this. And there's a handout to help you remember. I think it's over there, right? So here's six steps. And often you're in that panic mode when you see there's a problem. Determine the problem. Here's an example. Possum walks across my yard in the middle of the day. Is it a problem? No, but you may not know that. This could be a mama possum who couldn't get enough food to feed her babies overnight, and she has to hunt during the day. It could also be she's sick. We put those labels on animals and are kind of upset when you, know, you think it's nocturnal and they don't stay around. Identify the damage. Possum walking across the yard, not a damage. Assess the seriousness. All right, she might have pooped in your yard. No big deal. Consider the action. And this is really important because you need to consider that action. Let's say we put the word skunk in that sentence. And your action is, I'm just going to get a trap and trap it. OK, you caught the skunk. Now what are you going to do with it? Are you going to put it in your car and drive it someplace else? Are you going to kill it? I will tell you the last muscle on a skunk's body that relaxes before they completely expire is the one with the stink. And, you know, then you're going to have to burn your clothes and sell your house. Evaluate the proposed action. I caught a skunk in a trap. What happens now? Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Seek help. There's lots of ways to seek help. You can call a naturalist. You've got my card. You can call me. You can call a wildlife trapper. They'll often give you good advice, not necessarily making a charge to you, but give you advice about how to deter that animal from being a problem. Just remember they're like us. They need shelter, water, food, safe place to raise young. Learn, appreciate, and respect. And that's, I mean, I know that seems very simple. We teach that to our kids. But if you don't know about it, how can you respect it or, or love it? 
Those are the folks who put some things out there. Ta-da! The end. So I know that was record time. Do we want to have some questions first? All right. Who has questions? We're going to ask that person to be recognized and then come up to the podium. No questions? CJ. CJ always has good questions. Yeah, the pressure's on. Thank you. Okay. So, um, my question is, is trapping the only way to kind of get rid of moles? Our only issue really is that we both have balance issues. My mother and myself, right. I have Meniere's, I step on a mole hill, I could go down. Right. Uh, so that's the only thing is I, you know, I don't want to kill them, but it'd be great if they would just go to the neighbors. <laughs> Right. The chances of that are happening are pretty slim. And, and there are people who try and sell you something you spray in the yard, you know, to kill the grubs. That's not going to stop the mold because they eat other things. Right. And the grubs that they're eating are only active at one time of the year. Okay. So the other things would be to think about, okay, yes, maybe you could learn how to use those traps. You could try putting some deterrent down in the holes. Because they have many tunnels. If we could put on our uh, x-ray vision and look at these tunnels, some of them are maintained for generations. Some of them are, are like a clay pipe. So you could try that. Again, something like a rag soaked in ammonia works pretty well. I know we have access to uh, dog droppings. You could <laughs> try that. Okay. Um, and then you know, when you see that dirt that's an X in point, take that away, stomp it back in, water it down. There isn't, there isn't an easy do this and it absolutely will work. Right. I think before I was born, we had tried flooding. Like we called someone and they just flooded the yard. I know, but if you do that clue house. Come right back, right? Right. And, you know, if you're doing that next to your house, I always feel like you put that water in, it's going to find the one crack in your foundation you didn't know you have. Right. Right. And don't use anything like kerosene or gasoline or, you know, just go with something simple like ammonia or other animal products. <laughs> animal byproducts. Byproducts. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. All right. Anybody else? I got questions. All right. Watch your step there. I'm Carol, CJ's mom, and you've mentioned that we have bald eagle nest in Witten Lake. Huh? If they were flying over my house, how can I identify it as a eagle versus a hawk or a turkey vulture, vulture or right. whatever? So when an eagle flies, first of all, they're really big. Yeah. If they're an adult, you're going to see a white head and a white tail. That doesn't happen until year three to five. Right now they have one youngster, he's all brown or she's all brown, and we see them flying. When turkey vultures fly, it looks like they have no neck. You hardly see that head. And they have a really big, sharp point in the way their wings are. That eagle, his wings are way out there. I mean, when you get to see one, go and watch a video of an eagle soaring and just let that lock into your mind. They're so much bigger than a red-tailed hawk. A red-tailed hawk also has pale colors. They have a red tail and light colors underneath, and they're brown on top. The eagle, like the youngster, is the color of your sweater. And so are the male, uh, so are the uh, adults, and then they have a white and, and uh, tail and head. But usually it's just a silhouette, so you can't It's really, just a silhouette. You can't right. see the color. You can't see the color, but I would say go, just go look at a video. Cornell Lab um, up in Ithaca has the, the best videos. Look at the way that those are flying. Get a bird book, and you can see those silhouettes next to each other. But when you finally see that eagle soaring, and you realize how much bigger, I mean, an eagle is 8 to 10 pounds. A red-tailed hawk tops out at about 4. OK. Yeah. I was hoping I'd see one, but I don't know. Maybe I did. Maybe they I just didn't. they don't wait for us to look. They're just out there. They're out there looking. Flying oh, around. There's a bunch of big birds up there. Yeah. And what is it? Because. You know, when you're looking in the sky, you don't know how far away they are. Right. Because if they're really further away, they could be actually bigger if they were close. So 
it's just hard to tell. But they have fly singular. Yes, unless singular. unless they're defending territory or trying to make friends with the opposite sex. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, could you give a little more information about possums? About possums? Yeah. Sure. They're, they're, they're ugly. I like them. They're really cute. First of all, possums need extra gold stars because they eat a lot of ticks. So if you want to know why they're really good, possums eat ticks. Possums eat dead things. They eat leftover eggshells. They're really good at doing that kind of thing. Like I said, possums are opportunists. And they're going to find their way into places like if you leave your garage door open a little bit. Possum's just really curious. They don't really want to have contact with you. And what happens is that when you find one, you corner it, a couple things are going to happen. First, it's going to hiss and show you all of its teeth. A possum has more teeth than any other mammal in North America, and she's happy to show you all of them. If that doesn't work, then she's going to lay over, and the color is going to drain out of her head, her mouth, her eyes. She's going to be playing possum. I mean, it really looks like they're dead. Saliva's coming out. And so at that point, the best thing to do is leave the garage door open and let them go on their way. But they do not carry, even though they're on the list for not trans, uh, translocating, because they eat carrion, so they eat dead things like vultures, they do not get the diseases, nor do they carry those diseases of animals that they're feeding on. Rabies has a very low incident in possums. In, in the state of Ohio, the big three, and there's not that many cases anymore, um, the state of Ohio drops bait out of helicopters and planes in the northeast counties, up in Mahoning and so on. They drop a bait that's for fox and raccoon. So fox, raccoon, and skunk are the three big ones, and bats. Um, if you want to look at the list, there's a running list every year on the Ohio Department of Health that will show what animals have come in to be tested. Now understand that when an animal's being tested for rabies, that animal has been killed. The only way to test is to take fresh brain tissue. It's not, you can't just take a sample, right? So all of that information is available, and um, possums, I don't think possums have ever been on the list. Yeah, they're really neat, interesting creatures. The babies make a kissing sound when they're calling. They're, they're really adorable. Yeah, dreamers. Yeah. Keep the wildlife before, away. Before we call it an evening, I would like to remind you that this will be on my website probably within the next two weeks. And the other three that we've already done are already on my website if you want to review the, the video. Thanks to Waycross Community Media. They, they've been excellent on this. And we have one more. It's in November. And it's Befuddled by Birds, I yes. believe is the name right. of it. So we hope to see you there. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Carol. Thank okay. you, Waycross Community Media. Everybody have a great evening.